It's a scary world. I mean, uh, lots of things that kind of seem to threaten or cause us concern. Um, and some things really get to people. Uh, recently, we've heard, a, a, not a spate, but a, a few incidences of teens who have been so bullied through, the, uh, through social media uh, by their peers that uh, they've committed suicide. They've taken their own lives. They've been so overwhelmed by this sense that there's nothing for them anymore, that everyone has deserted them. And uh, they're very vul teens are, or teenagers are very vulnerable because of the age, the, the state of maturity. They cannot see a few years down the road that all this will pass. Uh, and so they can be very vulnerable to that sort of thing. And, and they lose hope, basically. Once you lose hope, what is there? Everybody needs hope to go on. And lots of kind of institutions or uh, people, <laughs> uh, various professions maybe, kind of uh, uh, play to that for us. I mean, they, they, they offer us hope in, in many different ways. So politicians, for instance, they, they offer us a lot of hope, sort of. Uh, um, I mean, if you're following the municipal elections right now, um, you've got... Um, yeah, I, I don't know how excited you are about what's going on, uh, but who's going to be the Reeve? But, but basically, what, when they do get into conversation, they're, they're, they're suggesting that we're go they're going to make a better place for us to live than the one we had before, right? So that's, that's to encourage us to have some hope. If you're in Toronto, probably we're more interested and more engaged in <laughs> the Toronto mayor mayoralty race. <laughs> Because there's always a Ford, and that's interesting, and then you know, uh, John Tory, and uh, what's her name? Olivia Chow. Olivia Chow. So they're tight running. Uh, so and and, and they're, they're saying, you know, we're going to have a better transit system, or we're going to we're going to have better housing, or we're going to lower your taxes, and everybody getting all pumped up about that. So they're anticipating, they're they're hoping that maybe some of this might come true. Uh, of course, we we have a federal election on the on looming next year. So just, I wanted to remind you that there was a, a federal uh, politician once upon a time that, that was maybe wiser than some and said, you know, I never promised you a rose garden. So I don't know if you remember that guy. <laughs> um, r retailers and commercial types are always uh, offering us hope. You watch TV, you watch commercials, they're, they're telling you how you, you could really totally have a much brighter mouth and wider smile and brighter teeth, or you know, you're going to have this really cool car or truck uh, that's got to have so much power you can pull a tractor down, you know, whatever. <laughs> it's all that stuff that promises you something that's better for you in your life, sort of. Uh, science. Science is a big one now that's, that's kind of out there. I, I, I'm trying to, the word is not pandering. I don't think it's peddling. I don't know. <laughs> it, offering is all I can come up with. It, hope to us. So science technology, for instance, has, has promised us a lot of things to make our lives better and sort of come through. I mean, it's easier to communicate with people nowadays. It hasn't saved us any time. I find that computing is sucking up a lot more of my time <laughs> than anything almost used to. So it's, you know, it's, it's kind of a, an addiction or something. Um, we, we, we have a family who are very into technology. They love technology. Some people will call them nerds, but that might be going too far. Uh, so one, one in particular, for years now, he's been following the, the possibility that, that someday we'll all have flying cars in our driveways. You know? <laughs> so he's got hope that that's where we're going to go. We'll get away from all this traffic congestion because we'll all be able to fly. I'm not sure if that's going to work out. But anyway, you know, that's their hope. Uh, on the same, on that kind of the on the lines of science is, of course, medicine, and there's technology and pharmacy, uh, the pharmaceutical industry always trying to develop new things uh, in order to make our lives better, and we're we're hoping that they will. We're hoping that they will do, make things that will prolong our lives, but actually, probably more importantly, that that they will better. Hmm? Quality, quality. Quality is more important than quantity probably here. So, yeah, so, so that's what we're hoping and that's what they're often promising or saying. You know, we won't go to all the ways that they do that. Um, and maybe economics, I don't know, yeah, sort of. Maybe not so much this year. <laughs> the economists are sometimes saying, oh yeah, it's going to get way better in two years. So like, you get, oh, okay, you know, it's good. Or that they're saying it may decline a couple of percentage points. I don't even understand most of this stuff. But uh, I guess for some people, you follow the economics and you follow the business uh, community, it can give you some hope. Uh, 
We seem to need something. The point is we seem to need something, and they kind of prey on this or pedal on this. Uh, we seem to need something to look forward to. You and I do. Uh, we need something even today, probably. We need something to, to, that we're anticipating, we're, we're uh, expecting, and we, we're excited about a little bit, maybe even today, like maybe what we're having for dinner, or uh, what we're going to watch on TV, or who we're going to visit with, you know, something like that. That's kind of, it's there, and it's like, yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Um, but maybe on a bigger scale, today you may have had a touch of snow, it may have got you really excited, you thought, <laughs> Snows are coming, I'm getting out my skidoo, and I'm going skiing, and you know? <laughs> and you're getting, you know, you're anticipating the coming winter. You want to go chopping ice and ice fishing. Or that may not be you. And so you may be alternatively kind of anticipating when six or eight months from now the snow will be gone and the sun will be out and you'll be back on the lake with your boat. Or, or you may be thinking of something interimly like, oh, you're going south for a while. And uh, you may be excited about that. Or you may be excited or anticipating visiting with the kids or the grandkids or, or all these things. But we kind of need to have something that's out there in front of us. It makes us a happier, uh, happier people. And I, I think that God built us this way, <laughs> that we're actually hardwired this way. We're hardwired to need hope, to need something to look forward to. And I'm not quite sure exactly why, but I think it might be partly to teach us patience or something. Okay? So this seems to be an important thing uh, from God's perspective for his children, that we might learn to, to be patient. Um, so he, he, for instance, we, we kind of have this thing, we, we li we'd like to have our instant gratification, you know what I mean? We think it's just kids, but it's not just kids. <laughs> uh, instant gratification is something that we kind of wish we could get to. Uh, but most things in life are not like that. They're the things that we have to look forward to, we have to wait for. And that's why we need hope. And God is after that in us for some reason. So what is the difference between, say, hope and faith? Uh, so faith, according to the Bible definition, Hebrews 11, verse 1. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things unseen. So faith is the evidence of things unseen. It's, it's kind of like a faculty within us that, that is attuned to things which you can't see, that are not accessible by the, the five senses, for instance. Things of the, of the invisible realm, things of the spiritual realm, like God. So it's only by faith that you can, and it's actually in the same passage, without faith it is impossible to please God. So we connect with God, we please God through faith. We know God through faith. We know Jesus through faith. We put our trust, our faith, our trust in Jesus, and we find ourselves connected with him. So that we have, uh, we have a, a relationship and a communication going on. Now that's not for every, everybody hasn't got that at this point in history. We, we, we would wish they would, or could. Well, we know they could, but they don't. Uh, so not everybody has faith like that. So uh, it, faith is is the connection with the things that are unseen, but that are nevertheless real. So hope is like that, except it's things that have not yet happened. So it's stuff that's in the future. So it's almost like faith that looks ahead or into the future and anticipates and expects because God has said it will happen, that this will happen. Things like for us, eternal life. Things like for us, uh, a, a new heavens and a new earth. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna get into that a little bit here. There's this prayer. I read it in the other churches. Paul gives us this prayer in Romans 15, verse 13. And I'm going to jump around on the scriptures a little bit with you today. <laughs> he says this, May the God of hope... So he actually gives God a title here. He's called the God of hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him. So joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. You probably get hope. Would you say you're overflowing with hope? <laughs> hmm. But that's Paul, Paul's prayer. So it's led by the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God would have us overflow with hope. Interesting. So it's not just something that we're to have a little bit of. It's something that's supposed to, we're supposed to have plenty, a plenteous quantity of. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And it's also it's a gift. 
So hope is, is something that God actually gives us or imparts to us by His Spirit, by the Holy Spirit. Uh, this overflowing hope, the sense that, you know what, it's going to be okay. It's going to turn out. Um, and that, that's that assurance. Scripture, of course, is, is chock full of hope. Earlier in the same chapter, Paul writing about Scripture says this, For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through endurance and the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. He says everything that was written was written to teach us, so that through endurance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we may have hope. We might have hope. So, you know, we got this, what he's really talking about is what we call the Old Testament. That was the Bible, the scriptures of, of Paul's day and Jesus' day. And he's saying they were written down so that we could have hope. But, but all those things happened. They happened to Moses and Ruth and, <clears throat> and David and Esther and uh, Isaiah and all those guys. <laughs> and just like a zillion other things were happening to all kinds of other people throughout the world. But these in particular were, were copied down, were written down, were described for us so that we might have hope. Now, just to demonstrate that a little bit, we can look at uh, something like Isaiah. The, the prophets, they just uh, spout is not the word. <laughs> they just spill over with hope sometimes. They, 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 they alternate between the two, Isaiah particularly. The first half, it's a little bit heavier on the judgment side. And the, the, the last part of his prophecy is very strongly about hope and what God has, has in store for us and for the world. <laughs> but even in the early chapter of 25, he says this, On this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats and the finest of wines. On this mountain, he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples, the sheet that covers all nations. He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove the disgrace of his people from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. What are we to make of that? Except that God is going to wipe away death and take away all tears from our eyes. Now if he's telling the truth and God never lies, that would give us a lot of reason for hope. And that's just a, a, one example. You go through Isaiah, you've got things like uh, the lion will lie down with the lamb. Uh, you know, uh, a little child will play by the adder's hole. And, uh, and there will be no, no one to hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, says the Lord. So uh, they will beat their, their swords into plows and their spears into pruning hooks. And this is this picture that is presented to us in the old and then echoed and, and actually even more strongly brought forward in the New Testament that God has a plan to restore this earth. <clears throat> so this hope begins to be realized when Jesus shows up. And uh, if you, the reading that Sue read a little while ago uh, is about that. It's about kind of the darkness that's in the world and then Jesus starts showing up. It says, he was, he was in the world and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. So it's kind of a, a bleak situation being described here. <laughs> kind of dark. So this kind of darkness. You feel the darkness? You know, he was, this is the Lord God Almighty becomes one of us and starts to walk among us in the streets of our villages and, uh, and upon, across our land, and nobody, nobody seems to know who he is. We just don't get it. So that's, that's kind of bleak. Then he says this. The light begins to dawn. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the power to become children of God, who were born of God. He gave the power to become the children of God. So that's a, suddenly the light is starting to glow here. So it, it, you may think, oh, well, everybody's a child of God. Well, everybody is in the sense that we are made in God's image, and God wants us to, to have a relationship with him as a child to, to, a, to a parent. But we are all, the whole human race is estranged from God. So until we get reconnected and reconciled, which is what Jesus came to do at the cross, so that we can be forgiven and reconciled to God, we aren't really his children. We don't have the power to become, to be the children of God in, in this sense. And now we do. So that's, that's where hope begins to arise. And it says, from his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. He kind of, kind of builds it up. From the fullness of Jesus, we have all received grace upon grace. Whatever is good in your life, that you exist, you know, that you've been provided for, that you have good things, that you know the love of God, it's grace upon grace. Grace upon grace. And 
in, in my thinking, that's what gives us hope. It's what you've already experienced of the grace of God and His help in, in your life that, that gives you hope. There's a great line in uh, Amazing Grace. His grace has brought me safe th thus far, and grace will lead me home, right? So from the conviction <clears throat> that grace has brought me safe thus far, which it has. God has brought you safe thus far. Surely he will bring you home. Paul says something like this in Romans 8 again. He says, uh, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not with him freely give us all things? If he, if he doesn't spare his own son, but gives him up to the cross, how will he not undertake to give us everything that, that we could possibly need? As time unfolds. So, um, <clears throat> Jesus, it's, it, we just read about, uh, he's going to destroy the shroud that is over all people, uh, which is death. Well, it's in Jesus that God begins to destroy death. The resurrection of Jesus is the beginning of God uh, bringing death, taking it out of play, if you will. And that, uh, that's pursued more in Paul's letter to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive, will be made alive. But each in his own turn, Christ the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. He means evil things. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Wow. I love those passages. <laughs> so it's kind of the, the big picture of God's big plan for the universe, and for the world. <clears throat> so um, this, is, this is the big picture. And, and we're called to, to, to kind of grab hold of that, to realize that we belong to a God who has a plan to put this world back in, 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 in the way it, it was first meant to be. But that kind of hope, that kind of big hope that we're participating in is, is also meant to give us hope for the day. I mean, we have, we have lesser concerns, shall we say. <laughs> you know, we, we have things that, that are upsetting us now, that we're concerned about now, that we're worried about now, that are making us sad now. And uh, the, we have needs that we, we, we're not sure, you know, some people, they don't know where the rent's going to come next month, right? And, and medical conditions and all those kinds of things. Uh, so, so the big hope is to echo back into our lives to say, so God actually cares about the little things too. And, and many of us, if not all of us, have great stories to tell of this kind of hope that uh, Jesus has provided for our needs, that he cares about the details of our lives, and that he answers our prayers. And I'm sure that if we wanted to take time, we could tell story after story after story of that being the case. And I know it's true in my own life. Today, we called it uh, Finding the Hope Sunday. And we invited people. <laughs> I know the odd person maybe showed up extra to churches today throughout the land. Uh, but uh, it's our hope and our prayer for us all today that we will be filled with this hope, this over, uh, not overwhelming, but this uh, overflowing hope for every concern we may have as we put our trust in Jesus. I've got a concluding poem for you. So what are we to think as we look to years ahead? Will we survive Ebola? Or will we all be dead? Global warming is, of course, a source of constant fear. Is climate change the norm? And will it rain this much next year? We hear of war and violence, earthquake and hurricane, and countries run entirely by people who are insane. What about my family? Will my kids have jobs, I ask? And will we still be able to afford a tank of gas? Now all these questions have been asked since people first saw light, and God has promised us a world where all will be put right. So let's not dwell on negatives. God's thrown us a rope. It's Jesus Christ, the living Lord. He is our surest hope. Shall we pray? <clears throat>